Joining us today is the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, currently a MSNBC political analyst, Michael Steele. How are you? I'm great. Good to be with you. Great. Uh, thought a great topic today would be uh, how do we revive the grand old party? <laughs> uh, Otherwise known as how do you turn an elephant, right? <laughs> that's right. Uh, first question is kind of like, you know, thinking back, if you were in the room night after the re-election of President Obama, congressional Republicans, Republican leaders, what would your message be for them that they had to do to uh, come back for the next election? Uh, let's get this right. Let's talk about our party being a party of civil rights where we champion the liberties and freedoms of every American under the Constitution, not just a select few. Talk about our party as a historically being a party of assimilation, uh, where we welcome um, the, the immigrant as opposed to repelling the immigrant. That, I think, is a, um, would have been my message and remains my message. It was the message I took to the party as national chairman. Um, yeah, you know, I will, I'll be the first to admit my style and my language at times kind of got in my way. Um, but that is because I felt the urgency and wanted to push. And so um, I think in this moment coming out of 2012 where you've had your hand handed to you again, um, when you look at 2006, 2008, and then 2012, you realize there's a gap there. Something's missing. The old way of doing politics is not what America's interested in anymore. Um, so we need to stop doing that. And for one brief shining moment, for two years, we did that between 2009 and 2010. Um, and we were able to win unprecedented elections at the federal and state levels. Why? Because our message wasn't about uh, treating women as property or looking at them as if they had no say over how to control their lives, but in fact engaging them around the issues that they were concerned about. So they were raising their kids, they're, they're running their businesses, and they're, they're a part of the economy. Um, so that's what we talked about. So let's get back to that conversation. You could brag a little bit because the last time they won anything, you were in charge. Yeah, that seems <laughs> to be the way it worked out, right? <laughs> it's nice to hear Reince and his team talk about doing what I did, you know, between 2009 and 2010. I just wish they'd give me more credit for it, but that's cool. <laughs> I understand. This is Washington. Everybody likes to think that they're reinventing something. This hypothetical speech you gave the night after the election, mm -hmm. they haven't listened, apparently. No, they haven't. Um, what do you think is the calculus? Because they've, you know, they've really gone hard on a lot of things like Benghazi, the IRS, a lot of things other than, I think, what a lot of Americans care about, which is the economy, jobs, inequality. They are, I, I think they're beholden to some old styles and some old approaches, number one. Number two, there is the cross currents of the legislative leadership and the political leadership. Uh, without the White House, the, you have those two f uh, forces really at conflict. I ran into that. You know, I got criticized by a number of senators. You know, well, you know, Chairman, you don't do policy, public policy. And my response was, well, someone has to because you're not. <laughs> I'm out here with people at the grassroots every day, and I'm hearing what they're saying, and I'm understanding what their focus is, um, and you're talking about something that they're not relating to. So you need to get on their page. And I think a lot of the pressure and the tension coming out of this town is, well, let's just, let's just play the no offense defense. Um, in other words, we're going we're gonna to block and tackle, but we're not going to actually move the ball. Uh, and we're not even going to try to strip the ball from the other team and run the opposite way with it. We're just going to block and tackle. So that, that emanates, that creates the, the party of no mantra right. that you hear. That creates the, you know, the argument or the narrative that the party is somehow, you know, intransigent. It is standing in the way of progress. It's blocking the president's every turn. They're not being cooperative. They don't want to work with the president. After a while, that wears on people's nerves. Right. Because at the end of the day, as you know, they want something done. And if you're, not in, if you're not prepared to put on the table what you're going to do, then your noise, your conversation, such as it is, becomes less relevant to them, which is what you saw happen in 2012. That election was over by July or August. Before the tape before, came out? Before, before all of that, before this, I, my contention, and I said it on a number of programs on MSNBC, the party was running the risk of losing the voters 
sooner rather than later in this process. And while the debate, the you know, the one debate where um, it showed that the president really didn't give a damn and, and Romney was on his game, that was just a blip. The fact of the matter is most voters had made up their mind long before then and it would have taken a turret to really change their view of the party and its nominee. Uh, and then of course, all the other stuff, the 47%, the, the, the quote war on women language, all of that was just uh, affirmation of the suspicion that people had about the party. Mm -hmm. So they had no reason to move. When you look at 2012, uh, a lot of uh, independents and liberals would say the biggest problem was the candidate kind of symbolized what a lot of the country is against, which is this feeling of uh, the top 1%, so to speak, or uh, you know, yeah. the wealthy getting more. Uh, how do you think Republicans going forward could uh, steer away from that image that the party is out for the wealthy. Well, or look, there the are wealthy Republicans and there are wealthy Democrats. I've always been amused at the, the argument that somehow we have we have cornered the market on rich. You know, most of the CEOs of the biggest companies earning the top dollar are Democrats, and they supported Obama. And yet, the narrative is that somehow they're in our pocket. I'm like, dude, that's <laughs> that's not the reality. They're not writing checks to the GOP right. because they're Democrats, and that's fine. So, you know, I think part of the, the argument that I would make would be more of a, a Jack Kemp argument, which goes to the core of who we are and always have been in my estimation. Certainly the party I joined as a young man growing up here in Washington, D.C., uh, was recognizing a party that saw my unlimited opportunity and, and wanted to be a champion of that uh, for me so that when I ran up against the wall of regulation, when I ran up against the wall of taxation, they would be there to chisel away, to create that pathway for me to move forward, and to tap into my entrepreneurial spirit. So that to me has always been a cornerstone argument for the party to make, which is to, to small business owner, that, that side of your brain that goes, you know, gee, I really would like to own this. I really would like to build this. I call all of that turning the elephant. Uh, and you know, I don't know if you ever tried to turn an elephant. I have not. But let me just t trust me. The the end you have to start with sometime is not the best. Right. And but you have to realize that it, it's very hard and it's very difficult, but it can be done. And some of the the fruit and and uh, ideas and pieces you can put together to make that alluring for that elephant to actually turn itself are right there. Now let's get to the elephant in the room, and that would be the Tea Party. Mm -hmm.